I was thinking of Christmas. Why do we only get people with the far end who achieve their knighthoods, achieve their fame and everything? Why not get someone who started up? And tonight we have Ollie Williams. <laughs> now, Ollie, <laughs> um, apart from having wonderful parents and all those things, um, and being brought up in Perth, in which of course is a very good place to be brought up, <laughs> um, went and read architecture, I think, at the university, and was employed, if I use the right words, your words, in an architect's office for about a year. But his spirit wasn't there. His spirit wanted to make films and do that. So this young man managed to bribe goodness knows what else to get into the film industry and um, got a few jobs fairly successfully, by most people's standards enormously successfully I would say. And uh, that was from 23 to 25? Something Can like that. Something like that. <laughs> and then he did what very few of us, particularly not me, had the courage to do, is say stop I'm going to do it myself and I'm going to produce my own films and finance them and get going. And how many 25 year olds in the country have got the courage to do this? I suggest 90% would love to and about 0.001% would have the courage to try. Ollie did and tonight he's going to give a talk on the first film he's made and uh, I'm delighted to welcome Ollie Williams. <laughs> Your mobile camera, could you please make sure your mobiles are switched off? <laughs> There's only one tonight, that's it. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Can everyone hear me at the back? Yes. Yeah, I'm gonna have to speak as loud as this all the way. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so my name's Ollie Williams, and I am now a film director, which I don't quite know how I got to, but maybe together we can figure out that. I made a film using an iPhone and I started about this time last year and the stage that I'm at is, or we're at with it, is we've got a finished thing together and it's in, submitted into a bunch of festivals internationally and nationally. I made it with my friends at home. Many of you I can recognise chipped in a little bit of money to help me do that, to which I am entirely grateful and yeah, together we all produce something that many people would, I think, aspire to do. Now, I'm not going to base this entire talk on teaching you how to use an iPhone to, to <laughs> make a movie on, because it, it, it's, it's something that would, it's better if you went onto YouTube and you went through all the technical aspects of it, which are really very, very boring. But I will can take questions at the end if you've got anything specific that you'd like, please, please ask. I'm going to go through everything that we, we tried and learnt from and uh, the whole process of making a film from start to finish. Of course, the camera that you choose is, is intrinsic to the film, but I expect it actually only makes up maybe 1% of the of the film itself. Quite a lot of it is in the producing and then a huge amount is the way that you edit it. And that is the thing that speaks volumes on the screen when you go to see a film. That is the thing that is interesting or draws you in, is, is what you're looking at, not the lens that you're looking at it through. So that's why we used an iPhone, <laughs> which the premise of the film called for it. And that, if you're going to make a film using this bit of kit, which is this here, which is an iPhone which is modified with a lens and a mount so that you can put it on a tripod. Uh, if, if you're going to make a film a serious film, or a film that's attempting to be serious like mine, then I uh, would say that you have to, have, have to base the story around something that calls to it. So my, my story is called Adira's Dream and um, down there. And it's about the way that phones are affecting us, specifically my generation. So I'm 27 and I, I'd say anybody in their early 30s to their, to their early 20s is being seriously affected by this bit of kit and especially your access to social media and the goods and bads about that 
we could talk about all night. <laughs> but I wanted to make a story about the, the effects it has, uh, how, uh, social media, how it makes us antisocial, essentially. So I wanted to make a film that wasn't a documentary, so I didn't go through specifically telling you this uh, on the nose. Facebook, this is uh, Instagram, this is whatever. I wanted to make something that was uh, suggested at those things, but was the emotional heart was based in, um, in those platforms. And of course, when you're making a film, the number one most important thing is not to get sued. Uh, <laughs> so I'm going to start off if this pointer thingy works. Okay by talking about how to write a script. And this is the number one most important thing in the entire process of making a film. You can forget using a camera. The script is the heart of it. The script is where the story is, the thing that's going to draw people in, get people coming back, and get people to remember you. All of the films that you see, most of them have very bad scripts, and that's the reason why they're so disposable, which films that you, you don't want to go back and see again. The ones that last, the ones that are timeless, have an amazing script. And they're the ones that say something about humanity, which a comedy seldom can. But for some reason, actually, um, uh, comedy actors, maybe, for instance, Robin Williams, they are the ones that, that can touch us emotionally the most. And I'd say that's probably some, some dichotomy between comedy in order to be a comedian. Sometimes you have to be a very deeply depressed or sad person and that they know the, the depths of human emotion. And that is what a script should aim to do. But you have to remember formula. And this is the reason why all of the films that you see are in front of you, is that they've adhered to this formula. And it's the basic three-act structure which was, I don't know if it was come, uh, thought up by Aristotle, but he certainly identified it, that successful stories have a beginning, a middle, and an end. It's the biggest cliche out there, but it works. So I like to do this when I write. Bear in mind, this Adira's Dream is the first and only film that I'd written at this point. But it seemed to work, it got, got the thing through. So this black line here, I, I draw one a, a quarter of the way through and a quarter of the way to the end, and that identifies the, uh, where on the story arc it lies. So a quarter of the way in, a quarter of the way out. And if you go back and you watch a film, any film whatsoever, whatever length, three minutes long, three hours long, it will, it will stick to this. And it's extraordinary. I'm going to ruin films for you by, by showing you this. <laughs> It, it, it's horrible. You, you meet the person, you, you, see, you see in the first like 10 minutes what their life's like. Why, why should you care about them? There's a sort of a little axiom that's attributed to this which is called save the cat. In the first 10 minutes you'll see you're, you're the person that you're supposed to stick with, this person you're supposed to be gunning for, will save the cat or something like that. You'll know that they're a good person. And so that happens around here. Then you, uh, it's called in, an inciting incident. It's the thing that is going to change the course of their life, the thing that they could go for or they couldn't go for, but it's there and the rest of the film is going to track them achieving it, essentially. You, at this point, you know exactly how the film is going to end because they'll, they'll have achieved it. Rocky will have failed his, at his fight. That's the inciting incident. He's going to get off drink and booze, feeling sorry for himself, and he's going to be the greatest moral fighter at the end. He might not win, but, <laughs> but he'll, he, he won't be a drunk or an alcoholic or a depressed person. Then they'll be shown like a, a reason why they can't carry on with this. Then towards the middle, there's a big twist. Towards the end, disaster. They failed again. They can't actually do this. The last 25% of the film, so for a 100-minute film, uh, an hour and a half film, it's, you know that the last 20, 25 minutes, that person is going to go from rock bottom to peak high. And that, that is the thing that you've got to stick with when you're writing your script. So I 
what I do is I draw out a line for every five minutes and I write out what's going to happen, the story in that process. And I aim to get at a quarter of the way and quarter of the way out all of those beats hit upon. And I know that my story is going to have something that draws you together. I didn't write this alone. I got the, the best, most talented person I could possibly think of to help me, who is my good friend Angel Jones. And she studied English literature at university with me. I studied architecture. And her boyfriend, a really good mate of mine, he, he went on um, to star in this film together with her. And he studied architecture with me. And together we unraveled how films are made or maybe should be made and put together like what we wanted to put into to this story and how we we're going to do it. And it, the whole thing wouldn't be possible without her her eye for good use of words. You'll see here, this is um, my sketchbook, which is the best way that I find to communicate with people. Uh, so I'm not a very good talker. I'm much better at drawing and I'm much more confident with drawing. And so I would draw out storyboards of what I thought the, uh, how to draw somebody into this character. So you see she's on a train. She's looking down at something. You see that she's swiping around. Anybody of my generation watching this in, in two seconds of seeing somebody with a thumb going left to right will know that they're on Tinder. <laughs> How depressing is that, huh? <laughs> And then you see a close-up of her eyes looking down at the screen. The interesting thing with this is uh, the, the, if you were to swap the order around on these pictures, it would mean something else. Uh, so you see that she's doing this, she, you look down at the phone, and then you see the, this, in, uh, it's sort of devouring her eyes. If you were to put this up here, then it would, it would feel like this is a banal act. So um, the order in which you put your frames is very, very important. You can tell a story visually, they did it for 20 years, uh, really quite effectively, last century. But that's mostly in the editing. I'm not an editor, so... <laughs> the next step is in pre-production is talking about producing. You sh your producer should be your biggest fan and the most reliable person you know somebody that isn't going to back out on you at any point. And I could only think of one person, and that was Kat. So that's my cat, that's my mate, and I knew that she would stick by me, whatever. Because she also wants to be a director. You don't have to be an active producer to be a producer. You just have to be there as the moral backbone. I know a lot of producers aren't. They're in it for the money, but if a director's going to fall apart on somebody, or if anybody's going to fall apart on them, on themselves, on the project, uh, the producer is the one that has to deal with it. So I thought of the one person that, that would be able to deal with me if I threw a two-year-old tantrum, and that was Kat. She and I split up the, the responsibilities of a producer, and she went out for funding, and I went out for fundraising. And so I was the one that was being very annoying, sending out lots of emails, explaining how you might be able to help me to achieve my dreams and help some of my friends to achieve theirs too. And she went for the other technique, which is go to the big places, the BFI, the British Council, those sorts of places that have a big pot of lottery money. And the idea behind that is to help young, mostly impoverished, so we knew that we weren't going to get very far with that, people into the film industry, get a bit more diversity in there. So once again, middle-class white guy isn't going to go so well on the funding side of things. So we didn't set our hopes too high, which I see a lot. A lot of my friends go out and their dreams are crushed when they get the letter back from the BFI saying, you don't have enough experience uh, or you don't have enough titles, blah, blah, blah. They, they get crushed by it. We knew that we could make this film on a very, very slim budget. And somehow, I have no idea why, uh, we were quite successful when we uh, went out shaking our hat. And uh, we were able to, to do something extraordinary, which was build some sets. My background in the film industry, I worked for three years in the art department. I was an art director on, uh, assistant art director on Bohemian Rhapsody, and I uh, was responsible for drawing up all of the uh, live aid sequences. Uh, so I d don't know if it's, if it's arrogant to say or whatever, but I'd like, uh, like to think that I, I know how to use a bit of flattage. 
And I, I know most people would love to know how to use Flatage. I think it's the most wonderful thing. But I designed a couple of sets. This is the initial drawing that I did chatting to Tom and to Angel about how we're going to do it. Then this is the 3D model I made of it. And here you can see the I was putting in the structures of the set. This was purely to give me a chance to put together a cutting list and know how much the thing was going to cost, how long it was going to take, uh, if we could do it in a modular fashion. And there it is built next to Dad's tractor. <laughs> <laughs> it took about three weeks to build this set. And I was going very, very quickly. The, the video that was time-lapse, uh, I wasn't going that quickly. But uh, this is what it looks like inside. And that's three weeks from start to putting the paintings up on the wall. I got in touch with an artist via Instagram. There's a picture of her later. And I really loved the paintings that she painted and the emotion she got through on the canvas and decided to get in touch and to ask her if she'd be interested in helping out with the film and painting some paintings for us. And she leapt at the idea. This is the other set, which is a little restaurant, boutique kind of restaurant. We put a lot of effort into building that. And it, that, again, took three weeks from start to putting all the things on the walls. It, uh, it was a car boot job, a couple of hundred pounds at car boot sale, and got all those pictures and all those random little trinkets up here and the terrible, terrible flowers. And we, uh, we, we were delighted with the way that turned out. My sister is a potter, and so I asked her, obviously, to do all of the crockery for the set which she did, and there's a picture of that too, here. Uh, that's my sister Phoebe, and that's all the crockery that she did. She also loaned some candlestick holders and tea light holders that she sells, if anybody's interested. <laughs> <laughs> and they turned out wonderfully. Here is Lucy, the painter, and this is one of her seascapes. And the extraordinary thing is that the, the last week of shoot, I went out to Iceland with a little drone to get some shots and I managed to find, so lucky, all of the paintings there. Uh, it was remarkable. So next thing, cast. Casting is 65% of directing. At my level I'd say it's 90% because I, I don't know what the other, uh, other 35% is. <laughs> I think casting, casting is probably in this context it refers just to the actors but I would say that casting is casting the right people to work for you at any level, right down to the runner. You need somebody that's reliable to do that job, and you need somebody who is equally as reliable to edit. So casting, I found hugely, hugely challenging because I had no idea what I was doing. I'd never been that side of the thingy what's it. <laughs> and the only person I'd really seen up close at a high level ended up getting fired. So I need not to do any of the things that he did, which are, uh, yeah, quite interesting. These are my friends, Angel and Tom, who helped out. And they had never acted before. They'd never had anything to do with the film before. They were friends in the industry, and 50% of those friends were me. They, they <laughs> so essentially we are all pretty green to this. But somehow we stumbled through it together, and I... From working with them, I'd never worked with anybody so professional. And I don't think if any of you were to go out there with your phone and uh, decide to make a film with your friends, uh, none of you should be worried that you're not hiring the biggest names, the biggest actors. Literally, the only reason I can think of hiring those is for the name itself, because people go to see a film by so-and-so, which has so-and-so in it. Together, we practised. And we practiced, and then we came to the last, last night before the shoot, and we were all feeling a bit like I'm feeling today, I'm quite nervous. <laughs> <laughs> and then it came, we were into the shooting, and at that point I was thinking to myself, why on earth are we doing this with a phone? <laughs> so, as you can see on this picture, the phone isn't a normal phone. We did a little bit of retrofitting of a lens. Now this lens is so important to making the thing look a little bit more professional. 
what you usually do. You see where the, the text is up here. The, the text is in a black bar, essentially. And they, these are non-used pixels. And these here are non-used pixels at the very bottom. You simply can't afford to put a bar on the top and the bottom of, a, um, of footage from a phone. It's going to look really, really terrible. So what you do is you put a lens on. And the lens distorts the image. And it squeezes a much wider field of view onto the same, as uh, same normal aspect ratio of image. And then in post, you just stretch it. And you essentially end up with about 30 or 40% more image on the same resolution as you would, which is remarkable. And that technology has been around since the 50s, but not for this size. Usually, if you were to, if you were to, buy, a, uh, if you were to buy an anamorphic lens, it would cost somewhere between 50,000 and 100,000. This lens cost 120 pounds <laughs> and it achieved exactly the same thing. And it was wonderful. This is the next most important thing when, in regards to the, the camera itself, and that is the app that we use. We used an app called Filmic Pro, and essentially that allowed us to control the shutter speed of your, of your phone. And that sounds probably like gobbledygook, but it's really, really important when it comes to producing something that you can edit later on and that you can synchronize your sound with because sound is recorded and it's always recorded at the same frequency. If you're shooting on your phone normally, it's constantly adjusting, constantly adjusting. And this theoretically should shut that down so that you can synchronize the two together. And, it sh uh, and it's, that's one of the technical things that I said I shouldn't be talking about. Then we, we set up and uh, started to learn a lot about, uh, so Mark, where are you? <laughs> Just at the end, and uh, um, using a lot of your photos today. <laughs> so this is uh, one of the camera setups, which was looking down on uh, Angel's hands. And we found that the most impressive thing about an iPhone is how versatile it is and how you can swing it around. You can really get it into areas that you wouldn't be able to do with a, a camera that weighs two or five kilos. And so I had it on a, a, a flimsy tripod that, that was able to meet all of our needs. The, the choice of camera will uh, drive down all of the costs around it, apart from lights, which, which I'll talk about in a bit. You need to light your scene quite brightly for this, and that, that, that's one of the disadvantages to a phone, is that it requires quite a, quite, quite a big kick of light, which makes things quite hot, as Becky will remember. We shot this in the middle of the summer, on the hottest week, <laughs> and uh, the, the first week that we shot, we shot in the bedroom, which was uh, painted dark blue, and the ceiling was black, and it was horrible. <laughs> uh, <laughs> then we moved into this set, and it was much nicer, but we had a pigeon that was living above us, <laughs> and it kept on going. <laughs> I won't do it, but you can understand. <laughs> This is the other setup. So this is a gimbal. And if you were to use a gimbal with a cinema camera, it would have a big fishing pole that comes over your back. You'd be strapped into it around here. You'd have to have counterweights because all your weights over here. You have to have counterweights, otherwise you'll be doing this, breaking your back. And the whole thing, you, you can't really use for more, more than 40 minutes at a time. Even, even the best person there have to take a break. This, same quality. I could do that all day. Uh, it's wonderful. We ended up shooting quite a large portion of the film using this gimbal, and it allowed us to get onto the tube. It allowed us not to draw attention when walking down the street. We could do any shot that we wanted really, really surreptitiously. E even things like this, <laughs> which was, yeah, you really get to know your friends well. And <laughs> <laughs> Next is lighting. This is Sean, whose name's being cropped off at the bottom, but uh, Sean Waldy uh, was my gaffer. He did a wonderful job, and that's something that if any of you are amateur photographers wanting to get into videography, get somebody who is pretty pro like Sean to help you, because they'll know how to, 
how to use reflectors and lights. They'll also know how to use bits of black cloth to stop to, uh, ambient light from distracting your scene. They'll keep everything in continuity. The next most important person is sound. And this is Sam, who is Angel's brother, who is helping us with the sound. Sound is critical. You can walk into a film uh, and watch a film that was shot using a Barbie doll. And really, there are cameras in some Barbie dolls you can buy. Uh, it's ridiculous. It, it shoots at 420p, which is tiny. But there's a guy online that's shot a small film using a Barbie doll. <laughs> but the only reason you can watch it is because the sound's good. And if the sound's good, you can watch it. So that's the most important thing. I'm recording all of this um, on a little uh, lav mic, which is recording my voice. And this is the actual piece of kit we bought for the sound. And it's relatively inexpensive, but it's the best investment you'll make. This is the, the crew, quite a small crew. Uh, you, you're all pretty local. I'm pretty sure you've, you've seen some of the, the big crews around that take up all the marquees down, down there over in Sherburn. We were able to do this on a really, really small crew because we had small equipment and small needs. The most important need, though, was food. Thank, <laughs> thanks, Mum. <laughs> I won't show this to you on here because it, it doesn't come out well. Oh, I'm going to show you a little, little clip from the film, but it doesn't show up well on the slides. So the editing. And this is the hero of the film, the absolute hero. I'm talking about Patrick who was our editor, and he is straight out of the NFTS, one of the best schools in the country is up at Beaconsfield. Uh, it kind of looks like a remembrance thing, doesn't it? <laughs> Pat Patrick was wonderful. He, he took a script that everyone really enjoyed and tore it to pieces <laughs> and remade the film entirely, and uh, it's down to him that uh, we owe the finished product because there are certain bits in it that just didn't flow, and that's what you do in the editing room. You can't be precious. And Patrick definitely wasn't precious. <laughs> and then this is us all looking around at the end of the day, looking at the rushes. And you can see the sort of look on my face of, what have I done? And everyone yeah, else, potentially. And then we got the post-production, the sound design. I don't have a picture of Louise, our sound designer, but um, she was there somewhere. So this here is an ADR session. And we managed to shoot a lot of the film underneath the, the Heathrow flyover bit uh, on the bank at Hammersmith. And it messed everything up because we couldn't use the splice from one scene into the other without the sound being different in the background. So we had to re-record everything that Angel and then everything that Tom said, which is so, so boring, but, <laughs> but it was amazing to watch. There's a full day of it, and what they do is they play back the scene, and they have, a, uh, have it um, subtitled below, and you, you're supposed to uh, try and catch up with yourself. And so, but they did a pretty good job, and you can fix that later on. Uh, sound design is critical. I, I don't understand it very well, so I won't go into it too much. And the sound mix as well is also uh, pretty important, and really nobody knows about it. It's, it's black magic what they can do. They can pick out a noise that will really say something about, uh, about a scene. And, and it, it, it's, it is, it's wonderful. You should, you, sh you should all go and have a tour of, of this place. This is Twickenham Studios, where they did the sound mix for Bohemian Rhapsody. And were able to make Rami Malek look like he was singing Freddie Mercury songs and get all the things in sync. And you wouldn't be able to tell the deal wasn't coming out of his mouth. And th this, is, uh, this is Tom here, Tom number two, who, uh, who did, it, uh, did it all and worked on Bohemian Rhapsody as well. We've got the colouring, which is another thing that I don't really understand. But to get the best you. out of your image, you can't use the natural look. It has to be as close to a raw image as possible if anyone is uh, into taking photographs. And that was pretty interesting, but it was, once again, days on end of sitting behind a monitor, which is not fun. Distribution, I, I really don't know what that's all about. We haven't got distribution yet. We're going into film festivals, which is standard for a film of this size to get picked up at a film festival, as opposed to going straight into it 
with a distribution deal, which something like Harry Potter will have. You'll, you, you'll know the moment you go into production that somebody's going to buy that project. The, ours is an independent film. Film festivals are the way forward. But you really don't know what's going to happen until you're there. So these are five rules. Um, last little bit. Five rules that are the most important things, I think. Make sure that you're structured when you're making a story. Don't get too attached to it. So let your editor take you to pieces. You're not saving lives. You're, this, this isn't being a doctor or anything. Nobody's going to get affected by your film, except emotionally, hopefully. Uh, or they'll hate it and walk out. Know your logline. So logline's basically the little, little snippet that you can explain your story in, and it has to have irony. So the guy with one leg wants to play football, and that, that's it, essentially. Who's your audience? Don't alienate anybody. That's it. That's a lot. Um, thank you very much. <laughs>Um, 75 minutes. 75 minutes. 75 minutes. The one thing that most people don't yeah. know is that it's not a short film. Never made a film before, decided to go for a big one. <laughs> How many days did it take you to film it? Single days. It took 14 days on set and then seven days in Iceland. But it was over the course of one month, and so we had weekends. Yeah, uh, it was. That is a pretty short turnaround for a film. It's not the shortest turnaround. There's uh, the plenty of films that have been made in eight days, and that's a full two-hour film. And then their uh, their film, uh, Bohemian Rhapsody, the last one I was the proper one that I was on, that was four months of shoot, I think, and that was horrible. <laughs> yeah, to be on one thing for that long. Yeah. Anybody else? <laughs> yeah. Um, Roddy? Where do you think it, it uh, will be shown? Um, I expect, I, uh, this is all touch wood if that's wood, that it's a probably an internet film like uh, Netflix, something like that. That's the most likely thing. They're the people with enough money to pick something up and it's not too costly to get it around the country or many nationalities. But who knows? And how will people uh, know about it? How will people know about it? We uh, need to get a distributor involved in that, and that's how people know about it. We do have a website, which is there, and social media, word of mouth. That's the, the majority of films um, uh, 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 get, go around like that, yeah. Yes? <laughs> I think there's going to be a bit of that later on. <laughs> um, yes. Um, yeah, I did, I, my, my CV is um, four years long. It's about, it's Very impressive too. <laughs> um, but my background's in the art department, and this, this is the thing that I'm most proud of out of everything. So, yeah, I've worked on Bohemian Rhapsody, and, uh, but it, nothing has compared to this project. And this year, actually working with people that I um, called my friends before, but uh, now I can't live without. Uh, you mentioned that you've, uh, you've submitted to a festival. Can you just very briefly tell us how you go about getting it into a festival? It's really sad now. It's all internet. Uh, there's a website that you can go on called Without a Box. Mm -hmm. they, they take a little cut of it, but it's, it's all there. You just go click and it's in, click and it's in. And you, they, 
Uh, most of the festivals have pretty similar uh, requirements, uh, press package, all of the sort of boring accompaniments. And uh, so they, they essentially know which ones need certain bits and you have <coughs> uploaded it all. There is another way that uh, lots of people don't know about, which is a sort of like a more personable way. And that's with the um, British uh, Council up in London who have selector screenings. And they all get the top couple of blokes or girls from wh whatever festival uh, will come over and they'll have a selection of films that they can show uh, at those sort of functions. And we've, we're, we're going down that route as well. But it all costs money. <laughs> um, but the really sick macabre thing about it is that a short film and a feature film cost about the same to put in. It's, um, it's really strange. That's another reason why we went for a feature on this. Um, How many film festivals we put it in for? About 20, 25? For the thousands. The thousands. You, you, uh, you, could, you could literally spend weeks just submitting. Assuming you get amazing distribution, <laughs> and then you have the best idea for a film, mm -hmm. would you, then, I imagine then you'd get great funding, would you shoot it again for a nice that's a, that's a really good question, and if I had the opportunity to use anything other than an iPhone, then I would use something else. <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I did have access to something else. I, I've got this camera here, which is more than capable of shooting at a much, much better quality than this. But it's more interesting. Using an iPhone is much more interesting. But do it once and learn about it. Um, it's, it's, everybody has one of these in their pockets. That's the most important thing. And uh, I, uh, I've got a lot of friends that don't do enough with their lives, don't push their lives on, because nobody's going to give you anything. You've got to get it up for yourself. Um, and I think phones are another, are, are an example of that. Everybody's got one in their pocket. And it's got so much potential, but you're just w making excuses for yourself by, by not using it for that potential. But, yeah. Um, does anyone want to see a little snippet from the film? Yeah. <laughs> Let's see how that works. Okay, so what will be the repercussions, do you think? What do you mean? Well, remember I enjoy the control I have over my characters. So you'd have even more control over your life? Or lose it altogether. But then again, it's just fiction. Right? God, these are always worth all right. A deer's life is a mess. Dara's life is in limbo. I'm stuck in a perpetual cycle of day after day. I'm unable to escape. I'm unable to escape. He isn't perfect. He isn't perfect. 
How many more men do I have to meet? Another restaurant. How many more? How many more? More tasteless food. Why? He isn't perfect. Um, for anybody that doesn't know um, what it's about, <laughs> uh, this is a girl that um, chooses to use this typewriter to write a script about her life. And she, um, she uses it to change aspects of it to make it better, to make it more rose-tinted, in much the same way that we use Instagram and Facebook to make our lives appear much better to other people. And the trouble happens when she chooses it to use it on somebody else. So that's what the, the film's about. Um, Any more yeah. questions? <laughs> <laughs> what next? What next? Um, I've written another film, which is better. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, we'll see how that goes. But it's uh, you're only relevant for six months, apparently. If you're successful, if you're successful at the highest level at any festival, you're only relevant for six months. It's competitive. But, yeah. So I've written another one, so I've got that in my pocket. Yeah, we'll see how that goes. Um, Having started in the film industry, Ollie, could you ever go back to working for someone else? I think I'm entirely unemployable. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's at the top of my CV. <laughs> um, yeah. Which did you enjoy doing most? Writing the script or building the set? Oh, God. Um, two different things. So, right, uh, building a set is, re if you're able, is really good to get yourself out there and get some exercise and use your brain and your um, put things together. It's really good for you, and I r really appreciated that. But um, writing a script, it gets something deeper out, and I think that's also important. And I enjoyed doing that as well because this is the first time I've ever written anything in 26 years. So there's a lot of stuff to get out. Um, so it felt good. <laughs> so when the MC is writing the script, mm -hmm. mostly they can't build a set as well. Well, yeah, okay. so, so, some, some people can. So how but do you get somebody else to do the set? Yeah, yeah. I'd say if you're doing something at this level, don't do it unless you can do it all by yourself. Because <laughs> 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 it just costs too much. How yeah. long did it take you to write the script? Um, two weeks. Okay. Um, and it was about... Uh, 75 pages. Had that been brewing in your mind for yeah. a lot longer the, than that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. For, for several years. My um, entire internet dating, sort of relationships, <laughs> everything, <laughs> all of that. Uh, so I, I wasn't doing that when I was 12, but um, uh, yeah, uh, the, it, it had been cooking away. But um, the script that I've just written, uh, this first draft took five days, and that was 100 pages. And I'd say that was easier to get out because I didn't have anything like, like uh, uh, it was a much simpler concept to get out. Yeah. Will you be using the same actors? In the next film, I uh, no, it's it's for it's for older actors. Well, were um, they were new to the old film industry. Are they, yeah. they now hooked as well? They, 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 they are. Uh, yeah. 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 Angel's actually, um, she's working out north at Goldfinch Studios on a few films, um, much bigger films now. And Tom has no interest in ever acting again. He loved the experience, but he said, I'd only ever do it for you. So, <laughs> so, um, so what does he do? He, he's, he's a map maker, um, and he uh, draws maps. Um, if anybody needs, if anyone has an estate, he'd, he'd love to do it. He's currently doing the river test. Um, and he's done Gilly's estate, and uh, he's very, very talented. You should, you should look him up. He, he goes under the handle of Last Maps, um, and they, they're very good. They're very good. They're in the sort of style of Tolkien. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah? Can you 
Did you see festivals know that you shot it on an iPhone? Yes. Um, influence there? No, I, 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 I don't know what influences their decisions um, because it's such a subjective field. And most festivals are set up where they have maybe 15,000 people with their own film submitting it and they have several hundred people watching these films and seven, several hundred different opinions. That's why the thing up at the British Council is so good. It's because you're getting the bosses, the, the actual eyes of the festival on it. The, the British Council, um, they have selector screenings, so they get the, um, the main people in to, to see them firsthand. Uh, yeah, and it's um, usually they only have space for about 150 films, so 15,000. Yeah, so it's one percent. Yeah, and yeah, it's uh, competitive. <laughs> we'll get there. <laughs>